Hello, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Torah learning of spreading more light into the world. We always like to start off with giving because how we give, that's how Hashem will give to us. So let's give generously so Hashem can and will give us generously. I'm going to put some coins in the Sadaka box. Please join me from home. We always like to start off with names for Tehillim. Uh, so we're going to say Refua Shalema for Chana Yantarif Gabashindol, Chana Bela Bas Devora, Yosef Ben Devoralea, Rezel Bas Adas, Refua Chaimir Ben Simachasha, Devoralea Bas Yafaliba, Esther Bela Bas Yehudis, Chana, and everyone that needs, we're including you in this. Uh, we're also going to mention um, for Hashem should protect all the IDF in this holy mission that they're doing, the Chayalim and Chayalo, they are incredible. And thank you for what you're doing for Kalal Yisrael, for all of us. And I want to just, we also do this in merit that the hostages are to be free. So we're going to say to Hillam in a moment, Psalm Chaf. And I do this weekly in memory of my dear grandmother, Rivka Dina Bas Yosef Yehuda. Hi, I hope you're proud. And my great uncle Chaim Dover Ben Bitsalo, to save a life is saving a world, and he saved many lives in the Soviet Union. And for my other grandmother, Bela Bas Bitsalo. So I'm going to say Psalm Chaf, Kapitel Chaf, please join me. Lama Tseach Mezmar Le David Yancha Adenai Bien Sarah. Yisa Gevcha Shem Lehe Yakai Vishlach Azrachan Mikhaidesh. Umetzian Yisadaka Yiskar Kom and Chaisacha Velasa Yirash Nasela. Yitain Lachacho Vabacha Vachal Tzacha Yamale, Nerana Nabishu Asacho Vishim Lehenu, Nidgo Yamale, and I call Mishal Asacha. Ata Yadaiti Kiashia, and I Mishikaya Neu Mishme Kachai, Vigurai Sisha Yunai. Ela Vercha Biela Vasusan by Nafna Vishima de Nail Hidonaskir. Ema Karu Vena Falu by Nafna Kamil Luminisai Dad, and I Ashia Hamela Yanenu, Vian Karenu. It says that when we say to Hillim, uh, the Baal Shem Tov and the Tzemach Sedek says, if we, we, if we knew what Tehillim would do, we'd say it day and night. Just yesterday, we found out on Shabbat, um, through the streets, it, it spread, you know, from the workers, the four hostages were rescued. And it's an insanely amazing miracle. So thank you, Hashem. And thank you to our IDF and all the other hostages, all 130 should come home. We think about you every single week and every single minute and every single second in our hearts and in our prayers. So we are doing this class in memory of a very special man, Rabbi Klein, Rabbi Benjamin Klein. He was my neighbor, and I'm going to say friend, who inspired me not by um, sharing what he did, but by showing me who he is. I used to watch him every day as a little girl. I was his next door neighbor. and. Um, Last, the last two years, we did two series on shares where people shared how they knew Rabbi Klein and how he impacted his life. And tonight, on his, we're, we're going to um, honor him. It's in honor of his ninth yard site. So his neshama should have the highest aliyah and he should come back down with Mashiach so, so soon. And I'm sending our love to Mrs. Klein and to his entire family. Um, we have with us today, a uh, few great speakers who I had to puzzle piece together, but thank God with the help of Mrs. Klein and some friends of Rabbi Klein and some friends that did it in the past, they directed me. So our first speaker we have with us, Devorah Natkin from Tzfas, Israel. How did I get to her? I did a class and I posted it on a chat. I have a little preschool called Little Gems. And this little boy, Dovi, and um, his mom was Etty, and she came the next day, and she goes, I loved your class about Rabbi Klein. I love Rabbi Klein. I said, you knew Rabbi Klein? And she said, my mom was very close to Rabbi Klein and Mrs. Klein. So I said, oh, wow, can you connect us? So we're already in touch for a year. So she had a year to prepare of what she's going to share, but I'm so thankful and grateful to have you here. So she's going to tell us how she um, knows the clients in a little bit, like how he inspired her. So I want to welcome Devorah Natkin from Tfas, Israel. So. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, so I grew up in Springfield, Massachusetts with a family conservative Jewish, went to, you know, Hebrew school, Sunday school, Camp Ma. So I had a bit of a background in, in Jewish things, but, you know, not uh, nearly as much as 
I, I basically didn't know what I was getting into when I arrived in Crown Heights. But what happened was I was um, I went to college in Amherst, and after school I traveled around like everyone did and was looking for the truth. Uh, and after, to make a very long story short, I ended up in, in Denver, Colorado in an ashram. And my father uh, wasn't pleased with that. And somehow, I don't even really know how, he ended up finding Rabbi Feller. Uh, and Rabbi Feller contacted me there, very behind the scenes. And uh, I, I got out. I escaped. I got on, a, on an airplane. Uh, it was Shabbos, I think. Uh, and when I arrived in, in Minnesota, Rabbi Feller and Mindy came to pick me up, and I really didn't know where I was going. I was very surprised to see some guy in a black hat and everything, and I really didn't know where I was going, but okay, so I got to um, Beis Khana after, as I said, a fairly clandestine operation, and um, the night that I got there, Moti Shabbos, I guess, the, the people who later, later became my dearest friends were away with Rabbi Friedman at some college campus, so mostly there were a lot of Beis Rivka girls there singing Tiffy, and I thought to myself, mm, okay, I guess I could do this for a day too, but um, I don't think I'm going to stay here. Anyway, um, in the morning I woke up and I was in the library and somebody came in um, and she had long blonde hair and she was wearing funky clothes and I thought, okay, maybe. Um, Anyway, I was there for three weeks, basically became from overnight, and uh, <clears throat> the people who were my friends um, had met Nahami Greisman the summer before I got there, so they all were very well set up in Crown Heights. So when I came with, I moved in with them on Montgomery Street, 899 Montgomery Street, and I had a ready-made family in the Kleins. I mean, there were other families we went to, but... Uh, Spent a lot of time by the Kleins, and I was welcomed very graciously. And coming from a fairly Hefker world, uh, I felt like I just, you know, hit the jackpot. I walked into majesty, and it was true. I did. Um, so I spent a lot of time there, a lot of Shabbasi, and I remember that um, they have stairs that go up. And at, at certain points in the meal, one kid would fall asleep on one stair, the next kid would fall asleep on the other stair, you know. And I thought, well, this is exactly what I want. My, I want my life to look exactly like this. Okay, well, <laughs> um, I remember Rabbi Klein used to make Maya Mahroni on soda or green soda, and we used to all think that was very funny. Basically, when I asked my kids, who also have met had met him, what was the main thing they thought about Rabbi Klein? They said, unanimously, he was a joker. Always <laughs> some something up his sleeve. So that was true. Um, one of my first memories is that um, it was the first Pesach I was there. I came in January, so this was Pesach, and we were all cleaning for, hum for getting ready for Bdikas Hummets. And... <laughs> I was cleaning the stove with a toothpick or something, and it must have been around 11 or 12 or something. Rabbi Klein called us, and he said, did you do because chametz yet? And we said, well, no, we're not finished. And he said, well, that doesn't matter. Stop and put down everything you're doing and do because chametz. And we said, well, um, okay, um, soon, in a little while. We will. And he said, no, now. And he said, well, we couldn't like figure out how you could do the because hummus before the house was ready to for Pesach. So we kept stalling and finally at some point we called, I don't know what time it was. And he said, Okay, did you do it yet? And we said, Um uh, no. he said, If I have to come over there right now, are you <laughs> that's what I'll do? We said, No, okay, we'll do it. So he didn't come over. That was um one very <laughs> funny thing that happened. Um, my parents also met the Kleins, which I think went a long way to reassure them that I wasn't in some other strange cult because uh, they were you know, as wonderful as they were. Um, let's see. Uh, eventually, I got married and moved to Israel, first to Bar Chabad and then to Spot. And once in a while, Rabbi Klein would come to visit. 
sometimes with Leia, sometimes without. I mean, I I never knew that he was here for all these, you know, top secret kind of things with the up brass of the army. But um, so one time uh, he came and he stopped by to say hi. And sometime later in the afternoon, one of the important people in the community said, oh, I hear you had a very important guest today. So, yes, I did. I'm the one he came to visit, right? So it made me feel very special. Another time, he, he, um, I, I used to work, I worked as a social worker, um, I'm pensioned now, but um, and I worked with, um, in a group home, people with mental illness. Um, so one day I got a phone call. It was on my cell phone, so it must have been. Um, when somebody speaking Hebrew was asking me that he knows about the, where the place and um, what, do I, what, is, what does he have to go to do to go about to get, you know, someone accepted into the place. So I'm giving him all the information. And at a certain point, I thought, this conversation, this doesn't make much sense to me. I, is this a crank call? I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what it was that tipped me off. I'm thinking now maybe he said in the middle of it, maybe he said Ichmein or something like that. But I said, wait a second, who is this? So it was Rabbi Klein. It was one of his ways of joking. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that I, when I still was in Grand Heights, um, I used to, I worked in Manhattan for some, as a secretary, and I used to come to, to Mahonkana afterwards. So instead of walking all the way home, I would stop by the Kleins. I hope it wasn't every day because that would have been extremely presumptuous, but um, it could have been. And Leah was very gracious and I would come and stop and eat my rice cakes and peanut butter, which was very new in Crown Heights at the time. <laughs> really was into the food that we all brought along with us, but um, I think it caught on at a certain point. So once when I was there, Rabbi Klein was home and, you know, they have this like wall to wall uh, bookcase in the living room and um, he walked over to the bookcase and he reached up like when he takes down this little pocket sitter and he said, you left this here once. Um, so um, All in all, I, I really, okay, so all in all, I, I, I just have to say that Rabbi Klein and Leah enriched my life immeasurably. I, I don't know where I would have been otherwise, but now that I think about it, I realize that I really didn't have a clue at all who he really was. You know, um, I knew him as, as I knew him and my kids and everybody, but so I feel that I was really just blessed and saved <laughs> by them and uh, thank god I'm very grateful wow thank you devora and now you have your own beautiful family that you so badly wanted so hashem should continue to bless you wanted to ask you before we conclude um i know maybe in the future we'll get more of your story about being in a cult it sounds very interesting but today's about Rabbi Klein, I uh, wanted to know, um, Rabbi Klein, his whole life was the Rebbe, and that's what he lived for, and he did everything for the Rebbe, and that's why he took everyone, you know, he his life was so private, yet it wasn't for people that was part of it. He didn't repeat anything that he heard or saw, but I, I know that you mentioned you had a personal, you met the Rebbe in person, and you had a personal encounter with him, so if you would like to share that with us today. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I, one year, I was there for those couple of years in the beginning, and then we all, my family lived in Grand Heights, Tushin and Olive, Tushin and Bed, so we were there many times for dollars, and um, just one cute little story, my youngest child, who's now 37, um, has Down syndrome, and when we brought him in front of the Rebbe one time, one of my kids was holding him, and, and he went, <laughs> he goes, he goes, Bye bye, Rebbe. See you later. And the Rebbe just had this like enormous smile. It was just just so heartwarming. So that was one story that I could tell. I'd have to think more about other stuff. Thank you so much, Devora, for sharing your uh, special relationship that you had with Rabbi Klein and Mrs. Klein. And um, Hashem should bless you with everything. Really, thank you for being here from Sva Israel.
So our next guest that we have with us today is Goldie Offson from Hong Kong. Uh, we'd love to hear your encounters and how you, what, how Rabbi Klein shaped or helped shape your life and um, what you remember, and we would love to hear. So thank you for being here. Hello. Thanks, Chaya, for inviting me on. Um, it's my, the only you asked me to do a Zoom presentation, how could I have said no? And you'll soon understand why no was not an option. So my name is Goldie Afton. My maiden name is Shem Tov, and I grew up in Philadelphia, not too far from New York. And when I graduated elementary school, I made the decision um, to continue my education in New York, in the Lubavitcher High School, so I enrolled in Beisrifka. The big question was, where was I going to stay? Um, there was no dormitory at the time. There was no organized arrangement for that. So my parents tried different arrangements, and they didn't all work out in the best way. And I finally ended up staying with a lovely family that lived um, on Eastern Parkway next door to the clients. Um, shortly into my stay there, they needed to take a overseas trip for a couple weeks. Um, so my father, I assume was my father, um, contacted Rabbi Klein and asked if I could stay in their home um, for a couple of weeks until this family would get back. While well, that family decided to immigrate from New York um, and I continued to stay at the client's house. Um, I stayed there throughout high school. I went away for seminary for a year and when I came back and most girls were renting basements and staying in basements, um, I was invited back to the client's house and I stayed there for some days and even through Sam Gimel, and when Hani Klein, who's now Gorelick, got married in Sam Gimel, and today she's one of my closest friends, almost like a sister, um, I decided it was time to grow up, and I moved out to find a place of my own. So I spent a good five plus years of my teenagehood, young adulthood, in the Klein's house. And I consider that one of the biggest gifts in my life I am forever grateful to the entire family, Rabbi and Mrs. Klein, and all their beautiful, friendly, amazing girls welcomed me so graciously into their home. Um, I come from a family of five boys and me, no sisters. So living with the Kleins gave me an automatic group of sisters and um, that I never had. And until this day, I feel very close to all of them. And it's um, really, really been a a huge part of the molding of my life. Um, so when speaking about Rabbi Klein, um, a term comes to mind, something that I actually heard recently <clears throat> um, about somebody else, but I think it describes Rabbi Klein so well. <clears throat> um, okay, so the term that I heard about somebody else um, which I think sums up Rabbi Klein perfectly, is quiet strength. And I think when I, that's just who he was. He was so unassuming, so gentle, so friendly, yet we all know now a person carrying so much on his shoulders. And I feel it to be such an honor to have lived in his home, not just visited from time to time. And I'm also grateful that I didn't realize the magnitude of who he was. I didn't realize the importance of the people that came to visit their home on Friday nights and throughout the week, because had I known, I would have been so intimidated and I would have been so shy. And I just was naive high school girl um, living the life and living in a wonderful, warm, welcoming home. And it's only um, now that I realize that I, what type of people I was actually um, being hosted by. Who, who, what kind of people came to see Rabbi Klein? If you could just, I don't, know, I don't know who they were, but there were like these, didn't you see these people that weren't Lubavitch necessarily people from Israel? And I'm assuming they were high ranking officials and high ranking, but I don't know. I'm just assuming now. And now it's just a silly little girl, you know, going to high school. I didn't realize. So well, we know because some of them shared their encounters. So they didn't hear it from Rabbi Klein. They only heard right. it from he came to Right. Right. So I would sit there at the Shabbos table being my, you know, silly self. <laughs> 
<laughs> and you know, saying, you know, I would never, I would just have been very, whatever. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a shy person by nature, and I would have not felt comfortable, you know. But so I'm glad that I was just naive. Anyway. Okay. Continue. Okay, so I'd like to share a couple a couple stories seen through the eyes of a high school girl um, that other people may not have um, shared or seen through the through those lenses. Um, one cute little thing is, you know, we're talking about forty plus years ago, um, and of course, I was a high school girl and always needed some more money for my parents back home. And, you know, this is before Zelle, before bank cards, before any of this technology, everything was done with green, green bills. And I would run out often of cash. And my father would just say, okay, you go to America's, you speak to Robert Klein, and you ask him for X amount of money. Now, I highly doubt my father ever actually got through to Robert Klein to tell him I was coming, <laughs> or to warn him or to tell him how much to give me. And anytime I walked into America's, I would just walk in again. Like I said, I was a naive high school. My father told me to go to America's. I would just walk myself into the office and my client would see me. He would welcome me as if I was some important person. And I would say, my father told me to come and borrow some money. And he'd say, sure, how much? And he would just give me the money and um, I would walk out. And I just thought that was totally normal because he made me feel that it was totally okay to do that. And in retrospect, it was like, I don't think that was so so regular and I really really hope my father paid him back for all those times that I that I went in there and and borrowed money from him so I don't know that anyone has ever called up a client a money lender but I guess that's one more thing that we can <laughs> that we can uh, add to the list um another beautiful story which I think so sums up the personality of Rabbi Klein is that he had this, um, I guess you can call it minhag, or this custom of gifting his daughters when they graduated high school with a watch. And um, there was three girls that were older than Hani and I, we were the same age, and each one as they graduated, sorry, there's two daughters, um, and as the two daughters graduated, they got a watch. And we were graduating 12th grade, and of course, Hani got a watch. But wouldn't you know, I got one too. And I thought that was the nicest thing he could have done because I had parents, Baruch Hashem. My parents were very involved in my life and I was very close to my parents. I would go home all the time. But he didn't, I guess, he didn't feel comfortable to give his daughter a watch and not give one to me. So that was something that I thought was so beautiful. Um, every child is from Baruch Hashem. Rabbi Klein would say to him, um, maybe it's not only every Shabbos Mubarakim, maybe it was more often, but I'm sure it was Shabbos Mubarakim as well. And he would say it out of a Tehillim with huge letters. They were very, very big print. And I asked him, why are you using a Tehillim with such big letters? He said, when you say Tehillim from this Tehillim, it says it by itself. It almost, it's almost automatic so much easier and so much more pleasant to say to them from a tillum with big letters. And until today, actually, you know, when I'm saying the whole tillum on a Shabbos Mavarchim or any other time, I will reach for a tehillim with big letters so that my tehillim will say, will, will, the words will read themselves. And I always remember the client saying that, and I find that it's actually true, reading it from that type of tillum. This is just something, small little story that has stayed with me for, um, for all these years. Um, so at the beginning of our shalichas to Hong Kong, I wrote a letter to the Rebbe and I received um, on my, as the Rebbe always did, the Rebbe wrote a note on the letter that we submitted. So as was custom in those days, the maskiris, the secretary would call you and read the answer or show you the answer to your letter, but you would not receive it. Um, in your hand because it was kept in the files. And um, that's what happened. We got an answer to that to that letter that we wrote. It was a bracha for Kachin and Hatzlacha and some other personal directives. And the letter went back into Maskiris. And many, many, many years went by. Um, 
and it was post Gimel Tammuz, very soon after Gimel Tammuz, and I was in New York for a visit. And as I was preparing to leave, um, I was, as I was visiting different places or going to different um, venues, I was getting messages, Rabbi Klein is looking for you. Again, this is before WhatsApp, this is before mobile phones. So if you wanted to reach someone, you have to pick up a call, call a landline, and try to track the person down. Um, Rabbi Klein was a busy man. He made multiple phone calls to catch me and to find me before I got on the plane to back to Hong Kong. And I finally got the message from somebody and I went back to their home. And I met Rabbi Klein and he says, I have something for you. And I thought it must be just something, um, some mail, which I understand still comes to their home um, in my name or some safer or something I left behind. And he says, look, I was looking through my desk. Um, I found this note. Um, it's post Tamos, and I think it belongs to you. Without going into much detail, it was a time where I needed to hear that answer again. It was a time where I needed a chizuk. And he said, here, you take it. It's for you. And I think that was so amazing that he, again, you know, it's not as if I came to visit and he says, oh, I have something to give you. He found it and he tracked me down, although it was not an easy feat because as I said, during those days, you actually had to dial the numbers, find the, find the numbers, dial the numbers, speak to the person on the other end. And he did that multiple times until he was able to find me. So that was just another example of how dedicated, how kind, and how unassuming this giant of a man really was. Um, for all these years, since I left New York and I left their home, which is over 40 years, when I come to New York, and this is not out of sense of obligation, it's out of sense of wanting to, I always make sure to visit and to say hello and to have a cup of have a cup of coffee, tea, actually not a cup of tea, just to sit and talk with Mrs. Klein and with Rabbi Klein when he was alive, just to catch up and to reminisce and to get advice because I value it, value what they have to say so, so, so much. And on that horrible day when Rabbi Klein suddenly passed away, my kids called to say, did you hear what happened? Um, are you, you're coming, right? For them, knowing my relationship with, with the Kleins, it was clear as day that if Rabbi Klein was having a Levaya and the family was going to be sitting Shiva, that I would be on the next plane, which is a 24 hour trip. They was like, Ma, you're coming, right? Like, when are you coming? Um, unfortunately, I was unable to come. We were starting camp a few days later. And I knew that if I would, come, I would have to push off the opening of camp. And I spoke to some of his kids and they said, no, 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 you stay where you are. My father would not have wanted you to come. You need to stay where you are. When you come you'll, after camp, you'll find the time, you'll come and you'll visit with us. So to end on a happy note, again, I would like to express my immense gratitude to the Klein family. Um, knowing what I know now, uh, running a household and a family and knowing what it means to have people in your home 24-7. Um, remembering the kind of high school girl I was, not always the most polite and not always the most quiet and not always the most, you know, law-abiding teenager. Didn't do anything crazy, but not totally law-abiding. Um, I realize now, in hindsight, what it meant for them to have me in their home always around, always another person there. And I cannot begin to thank them and to sh and, and share my gratitude to Rabbi Klein, to Mrs. Klein, of course. I mean, you know, the home she ran, I learned so much from her, so much about, you know, taking things in stride and, and running the, ho the her household the way she did. And of course, to their lovely daughters, to their sons, um, for being part of my family. Thank you for having me. Wow. Thank you, Goldie, for sharing that. And I'm sure Rabbi Klein and Mrs. Klein helped, you know, mold uh, different ideas for your shluchas because you got to see things that no one did, how these encounters with 
like you said, high profile people would come. No one knew who they were. Everything was top secret. They would come to the Rebbe. Um, we know today they were like high and um, top government officials from Israel um, and from all over the world. But Rabbi Klein, it didn't matter. Everyone was the same to him. He treated everyone with the same respect. And what resonates with me the most, I mean, everything did. And the most special part of the story was that he bought you a watch as well. Because how many people could say, you know, that little girl well, would, would have felt bad if in front of you, you know, the daughter was getting a watch and you didn't get anything, even though you didn't expect it, but it, it, it left an impact in your life. And I'm sure like you paid it forward many, many times in your life with your children's fr friends and anyone that you encountered with since something similar, because we learn from not by what people say, but by their actions. So that was incredible. So thank you so much, Goldie, for sharing with us today. And Hashem should bench you that you should continue with your shlichas in an over-the-top way. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here all the way from Hong Kong. Okay, we have back with us for a moment, Goldie. She has one more thing to end off. So we're going to hear from her again. Okay, so as you said, Chaya, when you go to visit Dayal, you often go to Rabbi Klein's caver as well, as I do. And I just find it so striking that his caver is the way it is, because um, unlike the other kvarim in the, in the cemetery, it's lying flat. Everyone else, most of other people have these tall kvarim that are, you know, six feet tall with their na name inscribed, um, easy to read. And Rabbi Klein's is flat on the ground. And I think it's done that way because of the, its proximity to the Eichel. But I think it's it it's so indicative of who he was. He was such a humble man, always behind the Rebbe, always doing what needed to be done. I mean, I saw it. He came home at crazy hours, left at crazy hours, was always, first and foremost, ready to serve and in the most humble of ways. So the fact that he's buried right behind the river and his caver is flat on the ground i think is just a beautiful visual of this giant of a man wow thanks for sharing that i never thought of it like that but it makes so much sense so thank you and i'm sure his work is not done he's with the rebbe upstairs and making a lot of noise and making things happen and every time i go i'm like Rabbi Klein, bring the hostages home, please. Um, and, you know, there's they're listening and they hear us and they see everything. We just don't see them, but they see us. So I just want to thank Rabbi Klein for his service to the whole world. And it wasn't an easy job. It, I mean, it was an important job. It wasn't an easy job because he was not allowed to say one thing that was told to him or he heard in the offices and imagine coming home. Everyone likes to hear share about his day. He, he wasn't able to share about his day to his family and friends. And um, I think I find it really amazing. Um, like you said, that he had a full house all the time. It's really not easy to share your space and your personal space. And I think it's pretty incredible that they did him and his wife, who was his partner. And I'm sure everything, you know, she's, she was just as she played a huge role in this with, raising her children and sometimes even had to do it uh, alone because he was very busy with the Rebbe, but she was a proud wife and a supportive wife and we could learn so much from her as well. So thank you. She's a dear friend of mine and I really, she inspires me every day. So I'm now going to introduce to you Sarah Hannah Schreiber from Crown Heights, Brooklyn. We're so lucky to have her with us today to share her encounters with Rabbi Klein, that she she had a personal, beautiful connection with the Klein family. Welcome, Sarah Hanna. Thank you. Thank you. So when I was first asked to participate in this Zoom gathering in the schools of Rabbi Klein, decades of emotions and precious memories came flooding back to me. And words came bubbling up on their own. Words like wisdom, integrity loyalty, humility, and of course, humor. Although I'm going to try to share some of these memories and traits of a very remarkable man now, 
I know that mere words could never be enough to capture his essence. Very appropriately, my first interaction with Rabbi Klein was via an old fashioned attached to the wall telephone that was hanging in my parents' kitchen in Maryland. I had just visited Crown Heights for the first time. It was the spring of 1974. It was the week of Parsha Shalaf. I stayed for that week at 899 Montgomery Street, and there I met Connor Rosen, Rachel Bwima Thaler, Miriam Rhodes, Rachel Shlomo, Sosha Gottlieb, Hinda Langer, truly an all-star cast. Needless to say, that was a profoundly life-altering and neshama-shaking week. Most especially seeing the Rebbe for the first time, Friday night davening at 770. Now, since I was a teacher by profession and my summer was free and it was spring, this committee of amazing new soul sisters told me that I must travel to Beis Chana, a yeshiva for women in Minnesota, to really start to learn about authentic Judaism. They encouraged me then to write a special letter to the Rebbe asking for his bracha for this plan which I did, writing on their kitchen table right there in apartment 3G. I then traveled back to Maryland to give my parents the good news that I was now seriously considering turning my entire existence inside out and becoming a Hasidic Jew. I had been back home in Maryland for a couple of days when the phone rang and my father went to answer it. He came back into the room looking a little confused and he asked, my mother and I were sitting there, he asked, is there anyone here named Sarah Hannah Friedman? That was my maiden name. And although I had been given a Hebrew name at birth, I was always called my English name. But my father enjoyed a joke. And so I answered, Dad, you know that's my name. You gave it to me. And then I went into the kitchen to answer that mysterious phone call. I picked up the phone and there it was. That voice, that heavy, heavy Israeli accent. I literally didn't know what hit me. I'm an American girl from suburban Washington, D.C., and I really had to focus to understand the words. The Rebbe gives his bracha for you to study at Beis Chana, and he wants you to know, getting choked up, he wants you to know that what you are doing is very, very good, two berries. Despite the accent and my confusion at the time, I can still hear the words that Rabbi Klein said to me that day in my parents' kitchen almost 50 years ago. Sorry, I took some notes. Of course, the first summer in the Twin Cities brought incredible new knowledge and soul awakening experiences. But equally important was that we developed a deep friendship with the remarkable Nechami Greisman, still Schusterman then, 1974, Lama Dalit. Very soon, she began her gentle campaign to encourage all of us older girls, new girls, we were called, to burn all of our bridges and to move to Crown Heights after the summer session, which we actually did do. She literally took us all under her wing and quickly brought us to 1717 President Street, where we saw all of the holiness and purity that we had learned about at Beis Ghana, live and in living color, and as they say now, in real time. 
1717 President Street, of course, was the home of Rabbi and Mrs. Schusterman and Leah and Rabbi Klein at that time. When I first walked in, Rifki Klein, who was about six months old then, was being held by Leah. And I remember thinking, how does she know how to hold that baby? <laughs> I was in awe. I'm sure that at some point during those early days, someone must have mentioned the lofty position that Rabbi Klein held, but I don't remember him speaking about it initially. It was and will always be such a schuss for me to actually know a member of the Rebbe's inner circle, a man who the Rebbe trusted with the most important secrets. And yet Rabbi Klein in his genuine humility, that's what came through. He made it all seem so normal. Rabbi Klein was certainly extremely intelligent, but he had an extra bonus. The extra bonus was that he was very, very wise about so many things, so many areas of life and such a deep understanding of human nature. In today's world, it's become very popular to consider yourself a victim if something in your life wasn't or isn't perfect. And for some people, unfortunately, that becomes the excuse to carry ill will and to even misbehave. The circumstances of Rabbi Klein's childhood were certainly not ideal, but we learned something very important from him. We learned from his example that no one is doomed by their experiences and that we all have the inner potential to be the Simcha despite what challenges Hashem has given us or gives us. I'm definitely not saying that it's easy or that it's simple, but it can be done as he showed by his example. Once I was going through something a bit challenging and Rabbi Klein spoke to me very seriously and explained to me that we each have a act an actual light switch in our brains. And if a thought arises that is unpleasant or not constructive, then we each have the ability to simply, simply turn off that switch and those thoughts will actually disappear. I was incredulous, just like that. But then I rolled up my sleeves and I did start working on it. It took some time, but of course he was right. It's a skill that I must say I've had the opportunity to use more than once over the years, and I am always so grateful that he taught that lesson to me. When I think of the amount of time that I had the privilege to spend around Rabbi Klein informally in his home, I definitely do have one big regret. I've thought about this over the years. I genuinely regret that I did not make an appointment with him and that I did not go marching in with a, with a notebook or a tape recorder and seriously ask him, Rabbi Klein, please tell me everything I need to know. The answer I'm sure would have been very profound and I regret missing that opportunity. Rabbi Klein was, as we know, a man of deep integrity. He had strong opinions, but not out of Gaiva, but because he was genuinely attuned to Emmis and how the world and people really work. 
I'll never forget a discussion we had once at his house when he said that one of the biggest historical mistakes parents over the more current generation made is that when they started to let their children change their minds, even about something that seems to be seemingly unimportant. Think about it. A child says that they want a peach and thank God that peach appears. But when the peach comes, they look at it, they wrinkle their nose and they simply say, hmm, I changed my mind. I don't want a peach, I want a banana. Rabbi Klein explained that a person's word must be rock solid because this is a foundation for Menschlichkeit and that a child must be educated from an early age to think before they speak, to understand that words have real power and can't be shifted around on a whim. I really doubt that this concept is mentioned in any child psychology book ever published. But I instinctively knew sitting there in his house when he said it, that he was 100% correct. And of course, Rabbi Klein held himself to those same high standards. And last, but certainly not least, was Rabbi Klein's sense of humor. To say that he was funny doesn't scratch the surface. He was clever. He was sharp. He could be kindly, sarcastic, and he was fast, as in blink and you miss it. Way before Reader's Digest, he knew that laughter is the best medicine. I'll give two examples. The first summer that Leah and the family went away after they had moved from 1717 President Street, went away to the country after they'd moved from 1770 Street to their new and larger home on the Eastern Parkway, I was once again on the phone with Rabbi Klein. And I asked him, how's he doing in the new house? And he answered that he's enjoying it very, very much and that he's never bored. So I asked him, what do you mean never bored? He said, oh, I'm always busy here because I can keep walking up the stairs and looking around. And then when I'm finished with that, I can walk down the stairs and look around. Here's another one, a real personal one. I don't remember the circumstances, but the siren went off on a Shabbos afternoon to announce that the Rebbe was giving dollars out at 7-7. It went off once, but I had kids in the bath that was there of Shabbos and I didn't think I could pull it off. But then it went off again and I said, you know what, I'm gonna try. I'm really gonna try to get there. So I got them out, I got them dried off. There was someone in the house that I could leave them with safely. I was younger then, so I actually ran to 770. Now I don't live that far away, but I was an older lady running to 770. I wanna get this right. I was absolutely determined to get there. And I ran down the steps because I guess I knew that the rebel was giving out dollars downstairs in the men's show. That's where it usually was. And somewhere in my mind, I noticed that there wasn't a line, but the adrenaline was pumping so hard. And I wasn't really used to the going in the doors downstairs by myself. And so I kind of pushed the door open so hard that the door flung open and literally crashed against the wall behind it. It made a loud sound. The problem, dollars were over. And the Rebbe and Rabbi Klein and a few others were organizing and packing up to leave. No one else was there. I stood there at the open door and I felt that it would be somehow rude to turn around to leave. And besides, 
that noise had caught everyone's attention and they had all stopped and turned around and were staring at me, even the Rebbe. I'm not sure how I did it because I was way beyond mortified, but I walked across the whole empty man show and I received my dollars. I managed to walk home, but I was really, really upset, embarrassed, and shaken. Very soon after I walked back in the house, my phone rang. Yes, an old fashioned phone attached to the wall. And it was Rabbi Klein. And he said to me in a very dramatic way, Sarahana, did you hear what happened? Some Meshuggah lady in a blonde shaitel came bursting into 770 just now. She made a huge tumult with the door. She walked right over through the whole men's show to get dollars from the Rebbe. Can you imagine? <laughs> I could imagine. Needless to say, I bench left that Shabbos with a smile. <sighs> May we all hear that chauffeur that we are yearning to hear. May all the broken hearts be healed and all the confusion be cleared up. May Leah and the entire Klein family be reunited with Rabbi Klein. And may we all be reunited with the Rebbe who went with Mashiach now. That's it. Wow. Sarkhana, that was so emotional and beautiful and heartwarming and it was just really, really special. Thank you so, so much for your incredible share, those personal stories, encounters. The last one made me like cry and laugh at the same time. Um, it was so great how hearing he was because he knew that you would be embarrassed, but he also knew he needed to make you laugh. How incredible. That's who Rabbi Klein was and his children and all of his um, friends and people that knew him are continuing his legacy um, in a real way. And it's just very important for people to know who Rabbi Klein was. Um, he was such a he was such a character in Crown Heights. Um, he was part of, you know, he was part of the furniture. He was part of everything. And he was always there for anyone that needed. And I know that thousands of people have stories with him. If anyone has any personal encounters, please reach out to me. And I will hopefully do part four in the future as well. Um, next year on his yard site. This is his ninth yard site. And, oh. we, and we will merit to see him with the coming of Mashiach. So Sarahana, thank you so, so much for your beautiful, beautiful words. And um, how lucky were you that you got very, to very know good. him and the entire Klein family. Very. So, so special. If I could put my vote in, let's cancel next year's meeting, please. To Yerushalayim before Lutzen. Amen, amen to that. I love that. So let's cancel it. And we are going to see him in person with the amen. coming of Mashiach. Amen. And then... And then you can actually interview him. And yes, we will, I'm looking forward. We will, we will feature it on our program. Please, okay. God. Deal? You got a deal. Thank you. Awesome. Well. Thank, thank, thank you, you so for putting this together. Thank you. The person who most represented it and most represents it perhaps to this day is Rabinyamin Binyamin Klein. I think of it as bittle in the voice that in the voice there is some kind of sense as if the basic gaiva and yeshus that a person is born with had somehow been broken. Adam Nale, Aitnagut Shelo, is caring about people. Mamesh Mesharet Moshe. I have Sharlo Marmila Heret Alav. Bemet, she read it a rebbe, behold at the roach of Sharlo Maralav. Yes, she a caras at Tor Dolailav. הוא היה, הוא היה מקבל אותנו תמיד בצורה מאוד מכובדת ועושה כבוד. Okay, so I'm now going to explain to you all what Chaya Cohen said, our first speaker on the GEM video, 
And this is what she said to explain. A noble man, his behavior, his, his caring about people, literally serving like Moses. It's impossible to say another word about him. He really served the Reb, for the Rebbe in all the ways that he can that can be said about him. I have great respect for him. הוא היה מתקשר לעתים קרובות בכל תפקיד שהייתי, ומתעניין מה נשמע, ותמיד הרגשתי שההתענות הזאת זה לא רק בשביל ככה שמוס, אלא שכדי באמת להכיר מקרוב את הלכי הרוח, דברים מהסוג הזה. So now I'm going to explain to you what Baruch Levy said. He was, he would always receive us in a very respectful manner, showing respect to everyone who came from Israel, certainly army officers and government officials, etc. And then Rubenstein uh, shared, he would, he would call often in every position that I was in and was genuinely interested in what was being said. And I always felt that this interest was not only for the sake of schmooze like this, but to really get to know the spirit up close, things of, the, of this kind, etc. So that's what he shared. At one point he came and he let us know, and he let each buck individually know, and he said, Babe Mahota Shush from the Altanen. He said, yeah, if you have permission from your parents, then uh, you were chosen, so the exact word, you were picked to be, uh, to be, uh, to, to be sent on Shlichus to South Africa. He loved, you know, walking over and then walking away and coming. He, he, he used to have a good time. I don't know if you know Benjamin Klein, as a and then the, he loved, he loved the drama. Livui madhim shla, yudi ayakar ze adin achacham. Shalamon ala tzava, vigam lea liyado, em yu madhimim, bimete, gama eruach ima mishpacha shlo. So now I'm going to explain to you what um, Abramowitz shared. Amazing guidance from his dear Jew, a wise man. He asked a lot about the army and also next to him, his wife, Leah. They are really amazing. Also all hosting Hachnasas Archim. So now we're going to resume the video. <laughs> So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna explain to you from uh, Spritzer shared. I remember him, a young boy. He was very active and always on the move. He was a very strong person, Binyamin. So we're gonna continue the video now. <laughs> Okay, so now I'm going to share with you um, that encounter that happened by the dollars. So um, this is my, he said, this is my daughter. She is a Kala by Binyamin's brother. Rebbe said, which Binyamin? This Binyamin pointing to Rabbi Klein. So the Rebbe said, Klein, Re the Rebbe, and then the Rebbe said, bracha and atzlacha. You say Binyamin as if he is an only one. Hashem should help that he should be like the only child for all Klal Yisrael. Bracha so now we're going to continue this, the, this beautiful video. Und er hat sich mit dem Schiedach 
sagt Abstiv Mädel att sveka sig att sålde kär bocher att man säger visst att jag kan stiga bäg med mig nu men att se allt vi ser där är gott av mig Nej, det har jag inte så gärna nicht. Alltså, jag kan inte vissa dem. Någon har det inte gesagt. Alltså, jag vet inte. Vad ska jag bli? Jag kan inte vissa det. Det är en annan sak. Det är en sak där det är fakt. So now I'm just going to share with you um, what Rabbi Klein just said. We hear from his own words. I went to Yechidus as a chatin. Uh, a groom, and with my kala, um, kala is a bride, um, and then the then the kala went out, and the rabbi said, "I want that after the wedding you should work for me." Um, my father-in-law, Rabbi Matzel Schusterman, was by the rabbi for his birthday, and the rabbi asked him, "What what is going on about the the shidduch, um, this match?" And he replied that she has doubts, and he is an Israeli. He, that he is, he, she has doubts that he is an Israeli bacher. And the Rebbe told him to tell the kala he is okay and a really good bacher. I didn't know about it at the time. I only found out about this later, and I don't know why I was merited for this zechus, which means merit. 